So my name is Ben Busby. I'm the scientific director of uh, the research platforms community uh, at DNA Nexus. Uh, I am also a big fan of coffee. Um, I also roast my own coffee. So this is an SR500 coffee roaster uh, that I use to roast my own green coffee. If you're interested, uh, ping me offline. I'm easily accessible at DC Genomics on LinkedIn. Uh, and you can probably find my email very easily. It's bbusby at dnanexus.com. All right, so what is DNA Nexus? I know this is a community webinar. Some of you are DNA Nexus clients. Some of you are not. Some of you are thinking about DNA Nexus. Doesn't matter. I'm going to try to talk about fundamental things in terms of light GBM and hyperparameters, uh, but I'll show you where DNA Nexus kind of makes that easier, uh, especially if you happen to be a DNA Nexus client or you're thinking about being a DNA Nexus client. So uh, basically, DNA Nexus formally did a lot of secondary analysis uh, type of work uh, with its collaborators and clients. Now it does a lot of uh, the new stuff is uh, sort of health and uh, clinical data ingestion, uh, thinking about phenotypes in this big uh, fancy uh, environment that uh, we have called Apollo. Um, and then you can uh, build and explore cohorts of interest. You have clinicians that you collaborate with, they can split cohorts, that's really nice. Um, and then you can conduct uh, rigorous analyses, Caroline put the word rigorous in here, um, and uh, you can conduct rigorous uh, analyses and uh, sort of, uh, and it's, I think it's a great way for clinicians to interface with data scientists. But uh, what I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about was thinking about what we really do as data scientists and, and specifically what we really do as biomedical data scientists. And so this is sort of, the next slide is my, my personal take, Ben Busby's take on, on this slide, which is, so here's what we really think about, I think, in terms of uh, translational biomedical research. And so we think about images, um, native or federated uh, genomic analyses, as well as uh, phenotypes. And I think it's really important that we have interactive data exploration. And luckily, you know, we have a lot of access to clinicians, uh, biologists, I consider myself a biologist, by the way, uh, access to clinicians, biologists, uh, really who are like disease specific, and then uh, really, uh, I think what's uh, really nice is now we can implement uh, fairly sophisticated clustering algorithms uh, relatively easily. And, and honestly, I, I will tell you that over sort of my 15, 20 year career uh, in computational biology, I will say that I think clustering is really at the heart of most of what we do. Um, but then now I think what's really exciting is once we do clustering, then we can start thinking about features and how features uh, wrap around that clustering. Um, and then, then really the, the beauty of this work that Chow and Nick have, has, have done is that now we can explain some of those features and think about how those relate to the etiology of our clusters. And I'm gonna go into this in great detail when I show you a slide of an alien popping out of somebody's chest. So watch for that. And what we're really trying to understand is risk, uh, and causation of disease. So uh, coming back to etiology, and I'll get back to that in just a few slides. So here uh, I showed uh, in the part one of this series, uh, you can um, use uh, this uh, fancy tool we have called Apollo. Um, and the really nice thing is you're able to uh, select cohorts uh, very easily and even build complex cohorts. You can do that with Jupyter Notebooks uh, on DNA Nexus 2, um, and of course, uh, you can do that with Jupyter Notebooks elsewhere. However, DNA Nexus has been selected to distribute uh, the whole genome um, and some of the whole exome data for UK Biobank. And so um, we've uh, looked at UK Biobank and thought of um, and thought about adverse drug reactions uh, in UK Biobank uh, as an example. Um, and the really interesting thing with that uh, is thinking about uh, how many participants have had adverse drug reactions, which turns out to be a lot. Um, and so again, if you wanna check out uh, how those cohorts were built, uh, check out this uh, video from two weeks ago. Great. Um, so then uh, once we built these cohorts, uh, really the uh, idea is we could say, well, uh, drug resistance is binary or is it? Uh, we're gonna get into that in a minute, but uh, we can use uh, machine learning techniques, relatively modern uh, machine learning techniques 
to look at these things. And basically, we want our machine learning technique in this particular case to do two things. Now, remember, I told you we're looking at 235,000 individuals. That's a lot. So we really don't want to be uh, super, super exhausted. Um, and I know that, you know, if you run a machine learning optimization program and you say, okay, well, look at my model and tell me which model is going to give me the best result, it's probably going to be XGBoost, except XGBoost is really going to be extremely computationally heavy, right? Because it's going to take every phenotype, no matter how sparse, into account. So what we want is something a little lighter. And so basically, in this case, we have a lot of sparse phen phenotypic variables. So with light GBM, uh, we get to have our cake and eat it too. Now, if you have more specific questions about light GBM versus uh, XGBoost, particularly in the biomedical space, uh, put those questions in the chat. And you know I can probably answer some of them. Um, and, and also uh, Chow and Nick might want to jump in on that. So hopefully at the end, we can have sort of a micro discussion um, on that type of stuff. Great. Um, and, and you'll have this slide so you can, you can Google all of these things and think about it and so on. And then, you know, we can talk on Twitter or whatever you want. Um, all right. So, but also with any of these learning models, uh, what we got to do is tune hyperparameters. So these are the hype, these are the parameters that allow, uh, the sort of structure for learning. And uh, my uh, colleague Nix likes to say, we wanna build uh, our house on brick. This is gorgeous stone. Uh, this is a gorgeous stone house uh, versus straw. Uh, so I just made that into a graphic. Um, and so I think this is work that Nick has done. Um, and he's really, I think he has uh, really exemplified uh, turning this into straw. And so he took uh, this multi-class model. So he figured out that there were probably about four classes here. And then uh, with this multi-class model, uh, what he was able to do is uh, tune the parameters uh, such that you get a better a AUC, which, I mean, it's debatable, but a pretty standard readout uh, for learning. So uh, this is great. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see this. And I'm, I'm actually happy to pass any of you uh, this, uh, this uh, tuning, uh, particularly if you're going to be, uh, or if you are going to be using UK Biobank, uh, you know, starting in the, the summer or whatever. Um, and uh, in fact, so I think that I would propose that uh, really it's going to be very useful for us, and this is something that my group will be working on, to be able to share these models. And, and why would we be able to share these models? Because so, I mean, what do we really do as data scientists? Well, um, what we want to do is break things uh, into clusters, right? Because most diseases have multiple etiologies. And then we want to be able to tune our models and hyperparameters to work for those clusters. And, and let me give you an example of how that works. So say we have a phenotype, and we call that Sigourney Weaver syndrome, right? So Sigourney Weaver syndrome might have nine classes. One of the classes might have, and, and by classes, what I really mean are etiologies. So two of the classes might have very penetrant genotypes. Think BRCA1, BRCA2 type stuff, you know, I mean, uh, missense mutations in there, thinking about penetrant genotypes. And uh, then uh, classes three, four, and five might have, um, might have, a few genetic variants uh, that really sort of work together uh, to give the phenotype uh, alien popping out of stomach uh, over time. Whereas classes six, seven, eight, and nine might have uh, be based on environmental exposures, say alcohol consumption, smoking, something like that, um, and have a few of the genotypes uh, from classes three, four, and five. Now, um, the, obviously, uh, the alien uh, jumping out of the stomach is a fictitious example, but what I've just described is actually the current thinking about a relatively common gastrointestinal disease. So uh, I would submit to you that what we are looking for when we are doing this learning is actually looking for different classes that require either different data models or different hyperparameters that actually need to be set on the fly as we converge 
towards those models in these subclasses that are set by something like KBS. So we want to be able to share them. And here is an example from this uh, very example of that. So what we can see is if that we have the wrong number of classes that the AUC does not do as well with the same model um, as uh, when we have an appropriate multi-class model. And I think, I think this is a really good indication that we want to be able to set our K values well and then tune our parameters uh, for uh, each situation uh, that we are dealing with. And, and the really exciting thing about this is then we can start thinking about which features are most important in every given situation. So we can see those penetrant etiologies. We can see those environmental etiologies uh, with genetic risk factors. And so uh, that is something that I think Chow and Nick have really laid the groundwork for uh, and, and exemplified in this ADR work. And so that's what I'm looking forward uh, to telling you about next time. I believe now it's in three weeks, we did push it back. Um, and so I think check out uh, Chow's Medium article if you haven't um, about susceptibility to adverse drug reactions. And we'll talk about uh, how you can explain some of these features uh, derived uh, from light GBM uh, next time. So uh, here are some references. Again, this uh, PowerPoint will be sent to you so you don't have to uh, ridiculously try to copy them down. Um, and uh, thanks to these people. I think I called most of them out, but thanks also to Ames and Peter and uh, Caroline. And uh, with that, um, I think we'll take any questions. Again, the blog posts. Oh, right. And uh, the uh, SHAP, uh, where we'll be doing explainable AI uh, will be April 1st at um, uh, 8.30 p Pacific time. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, concerns, other webinars you'd like to see, uh, please uh, write to home series at dnanexus.com. All right. Well, thanks everybody for attending. Again, uh, enjoy your coffee and uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day. St. Patrick's Day to those of you who celebrate. Um, and with that, have a phenomenal day. All right.